And it's again time for, for the final Q&A on, on both from the last segment and also from any of the, the segments that was uh, covered before. Okay, Eleanor, Eleanor. Oh, hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Oh, hi. Um, thank you. This is a very uh, interesting presentation. Uh, I have a startup with four founders, and we work in aerospace supply chain. And right now, uh, we're still finishing our POC, so our proof of concept. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to know, in terms of, because I have some of the founders who think that it's a good idea to get uh, 20 million or try to get a 20 million dollar investment, um, and I wanted to know about uh, what sort of, if you could say maybe one or two things on the risks that are involved in taking too much money uh, rapidly. And uh, then a question about, you did touch on the advisors, um, but what sort of equity should advisors receive, if any? Yeah, so um, uh, on the first question, I would say that, uh, that of course, there, there's two things uh, when it comes to specifically considering investment of that size is, uh, the most important question is, does the company need the money? Do you know that the, the money will, how it will be specifically spent to actually make sure that the company progress faster to results? So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's usually getting money, is, is the, it comes from that we can do more and we can have more room to, you know, spend money. But... Uh, but also from investors' perspective, spending money at early phase when it's clearly not uh, proven to multiply itself mm. uh, it is, is wasting money. And uh, so, so it depends really there, for example, I don't know in your specific business case and uh, how far you can take it with the existing resources. And I would recommend most likely that some investments, but 20 million sounds like you could already create a new medicine with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I was thinking more along the lines of 100,000. Yeah, exactly. So that seems more kind of, uh, um, there's, there's certain creativity that comes from lack of money mm. uh, that, that tends to get lost when you get money. Okay. Uh, so, so usually you, when when you are constrained, and I'm not saying be overly constrained, but mm -hmm. when you're constrained, you are always thinking of most creative way of achieving a goal. And and so, for example, I give this example that uh, let's say there's a great summit or, or, or event, industry event, where you would think that we need to get there. Mm -hmm. And you have money, you will just buy the tickets, you will just buy the booth, and you will be there amongst others. But if mm. you don't have money, you probably will try to reach the organizer and pitch your idea, why, would, why should you be on the stage? Mm. Which one is more impactful, if you get to be on the stage or if you want the booth? The other one costs money, the other one costs effort and creativity. Mm. And Good. the other is, is very different. So it's the same whether you buy an ad on the paper or whether you try to get the journalist to write about you, whatever that angle is. So the other part is creativity, the other part is money. And um, so when a lot of money becomes relevant is when you already know all the clever ways and then you spend money on ex using more of those and on top of you also buy uh, easy, quick ways of uh, expanding. So that's from the investor kind of money use um, mm. thinking. So I, I would I would kind of balance that money that there's always enough, but not too much that it kills the creativity, and, and specifically not before you have actually proven that you can generate revenues. Okay. And for the advisors? 
And for the advisors, uh, I, I mean, it's quite common that you can start with a kind of mentoring type of relationship for a couple of sessions, or you can have free advisory from specific organizations or programs, maybe pro bono, or maybe they're paid by some other uh, finance uh, organization or entity. Uh, that's okay for simple questions or generic uh, questions, but when you're looking for someone to start contributing uh, their own personal network, putting their own name and trust into helping the company, it requires them to learn and trust and spend time with the company. Uh, then that becomes real work. Even though it may be strategy work, four hours a month or something like that, not yeah. the same level as uh, operational level, it's still work. And uh, it's much easier to work with a clear arrangement with anyone. So I would make an arrangement with options or, or straight equity, but I would also put clear responsibilities, what they need to deliver based on what they say they can deliver. Mm. So even if they deliver on strategy or contacts or leads or knowledge, you just want to write something down that, that they actually will do that as well. Or it can be as simple as you are available four hours a month when I need to have a strategy conversation. You, you may not want to use that every time, but at least they should be available. Right. And, and how much equity would you be comfortable giving that kind of person? Less so, than 10%, obviously. but Yeah, so if it's really early, then, then definitely like, like up to 2%. But if it's a later phase already, then it can be 1% or less. Okay. So, so, but that really depends on the on how early it is, because it's the same, the value, the kind of further you get along, the, the, the less, or the more valuable the company is, of course, at okay. least in, until it's proven <laughs> proven in the markets. But anyway, at least there's a significant contribution already by others. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, let's see, Andrea. Andrea, uh, it can seems that, yeah, I can hear you now. Perfect, and um, thanks also from my side for the excellent presentation um, all over um, the aspects of the subject. My question is regarding the difference between vesting and options. Uh, I'm not sure it is, is a super clear, and let me give you my example. I joined a startup which was founded by someone else and to join this startup I have two roles. One is partner, so I bought equity and I paid cash to get you know, X percentage and then I also have a role as an executive or, or manager and for that role I will have a basic salary which of course is below my professional standards but I agreed because I believe in the project. So I'm wondering what kind of a conversation shall I have because we are in, in, in this phase where we are about to have the conversation about um, how to remunerate my, my investment. Shall it be a conversation about vesting? Shall it be a conversation about stock options? And if, from your words, it is clear how to calculate because it will be about the total unpaid time contribution over the period and that gives me a frame but I was wondering whether you could put me in the right direction about how to have this conversation with my business partner yeah okay so first the first point between the difference between option and vesting is that uh, when you are founding a company and basically there are the hundred percent of the shares uh, in the beginning um, so so that may be hundred shares or thousand shares or ten thousand shares or million shares and in, in the number of shares uh, basically those need to be owned by someone so they, they in some countries uh, you, the company may own also shares significant amounts of shares but it's not necessarily in all countries where company can own shares so if it's only the other founders who own then the shares then it may also become tax issue 
how to transfer the shares between from founder to another. So if you're kind of using one founder as the pool of where other founders then earn their shares. Uh, so therefore, the vesting model is basically that everyone has the shares designed on how the ownership look, should look like three years from now. And then everyone makes promises against that journey, and then then that's that's how kind of that gets uh, in place. And then the vesting is there to to make sure that there's rules and agreements saying that if someone doesn't uh, deliver, then then they don't get to keep the shares. And and then then that gives creates that model. Uh, so so therefore, option model is not really uh, necessary or useful because you need shareholder agreement also for other purposes and you can build this in, into there. So, so then uh, option is then to use when you already have that one structure in place and you are create, taking new members and giving additional shares in the future, then you don't necessarily need to create those shares to exist because it may also end up that the, the contributions never materialized and therefore basically the options get void. Um, so, so you just save on the admin and it brings you some flexibility. Uh, then when you are the one joining the team, it's a negotiation like any other. And, and for example, uh, when trying to balance uh, the ownership with uh, the value of a person, if looking for example their typical salary rate, uh, the conversation could go like this, that, okay, uh, we think our company is valued half a million, and then the, 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 the person joining say that my usual rate would be 10,000 a month. And then the other party could say, well, if your rate is 10,000 a month, then our company value is actually 1 million. So it becomes a negotiation anyway to find what is um, uh, a kind of... Uh, an, an, feels the right arrangement and then either either both parties agree or they don't agree and it, it's it's no more complex than that so but then what instruments are used in regards of how much salary versus options versus other arrangements is then they are kind of I would say tools within that uh, uh, kind of top level agreement uh, how to find the right right level Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, let's have Michael. Hi. Um, thank you for that last portion. Um, very informative. And because I'm going through that process right now, um, I've noticed a few things that I would like to ask. Um, so first of them is I have... Um, a mentor slash advisor on board with this startup idea and um, the situation with him is he proposed um, not necessarily equity based sharing but actually when the company for example gains investment or profit is taken um, he'll get a revenue portion um, but my question is if for example his role is to for example provide like networking opportunities etc at what point should I have the revenue sharing or is that a good idea so should we wait until there's profits or until investment or what stage, number one, should he receive that? And number two, what is a fair or correct amount of ratio? Okay. Yeah. So, so basically that very much uh, what kind of uh, country or, or, or earn or reward is, is most suitable definitely depends on the type of advisor. So usually in the beginning uh, there's a need for kind of very generic, maybe kind of senior, uh, been there, done that type of uh, general business building advisory. But then when it becomes, if it's specifically, for example, industry leads, uh, then it may be very specific and actually most, uh, also the, the, the reward or the earnings should be kind of driving more of certain type of behavior. So equity, Related, so a direct equity or um, or uh, or options in general are of course useful for those types of things that increase company value or is not easily kind of pinpointed that by doing this it lead, will lead to that, but it kind of improves the whole company one way or the other, so it goes to the overall value of the company. But if it's for example 
let's say it would be someone um, advising uh, user experience, then you would rather want to tie it specific to a product uh, performance, for example, and, and, and so forth. So it, it, it goes hand in hand in, in kind of what the contributions, uh, how do they materialize, and it can be also a combination of, of, of more than one type. Okay, so at the moment it is a case of where it's not direct specific expertise, but it's a case of that person brings contacts at networking. So I, I feel that equity shouldn't necessarily be given away, or portion of the company should be given away for that reason, but if the services as are required, then maybe there is a, like a, um, for that month, a revenue option of maybe you generate, you get, for example, I don't know, 1%. Yeah, it, it sounds like a, a combination would be suitable and also phasing it out a little bit, that starting from one and then seeing if the relationship, how it evolves, and then maybe adding another step along the way and having a clear mutual understanding that this is how we're going to do it. So not to make, because the whole purpose of, external after the core co-founders you have much more flexibility of kind of building a path when in the beginning you need to build a foundation for the whole thing so so that kind of changed the dynamics that you don't need to you can make it iteratively and start from one level and say if we if this works then we can add another level to this okay okay cool um and then the other question i had was um so I'm a case where I'm the founder, I'm the one that came up with the idea, birth the vision, the direction of the company, the culture, what kind of people we want involved and where we're going with it. And now we've recently just got on board a, a person that wants to be a CTO for the company. So yeah. that person can help bring to life the, the app essentially. Um, so where I'm at a stage is I don't currently know enough about his skill set in order for me to part a large amount of equity within the company. But then you introduce the concept of vesting. Um, so my question is, how much, how do I gauge how, how much of, of worth I should give away to the company for someone who's, let's say, four months into being a part of this process, who says they're going to be a CTO, um, what would you deem as a valuable amount of equity to give away? So I, I, I think it's... Uh Overall, it's the same concept of contribution uh, over time, and then you can separate the kind of, if you think of three months, then you could say how much of that, uh, no, three years, how much of that three years you have already head start, kind of how much you have kind of made progress and earned uh, before uh, he, he joins, and then calculating the rest of the three years and kind of as, as one way. But so you in but so, so I want to continue just to finalize the point that then once you have the, the, the levels of how much those would be, it sounds to me that because you don't have really capability of uh, evaluating his skills, then I would put more weight on the first vesting milestone, for example, to have a working product out um, that, that then at least if, if the person is not capable of delivering that product, then, then the vesting is heavy on being able to do that. So then at least there is a product that functions. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's so that you, you make it lighter in the beginning of the vesting terms just for the time contribution. So then it rel re relies more heavily on actually being able to deliver the product. Okay, but and that's um, a very interesting point. So then in that case, let's say he doesn't do as good a job as we would have liked, um, percentage-wise, how does that equate? Well, basically, then it means that the, the, the person was unable to, to deliver what he himself or herself clearly agreed that he can or she can. So, so uh, then, basically, they just didn't earn their shares. You can then have something that, for example, they can steal from the contribution. They can get you know, five, five percent of the first vesting period uh, portion um, just for the effort. But uh, all of these things, of course, you should not even try to define single-handedly from your side and make an offer, but say, hey, just 
openly showing, saying your concerns and putting that company aside that it's your child together in the sense that you're not trying to win over a shareholder against the shareholder, but you are just looking what is the best for the company. So how do we structure this agreement with kind of knowing these tools that we have in hand and you knowing yourself what you can do and you, what you trust you can deliver uh, because then if you can't, then, then we need to have protection for, for the company. So it's not against the other founder, but, but uh, it's, it's protecting the company. So that's the mindset that you should both have. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's have another question from Philip. Um, do you have... Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the experience sharing. Um, so, so, you know, I'm currently have a, a co-founder. Uh, um, I own 50% of the company. He owns 40%. We've we've allocated 10% for for an, an employee pool. And um, this this company was born as a as a spin-off of of another company that I that I work for, and I am. Currently, only allocating 25% of my of my work in this in this venture. And um, my question is, how big of a red flag is it for for investors? Uh, you know that the the biggest shareholder of the company is is only involved 25%, and I'm, I'm not able to to exit my my uh, my other commitments at at the moment. I'm a bit worried because we we launched the product. It's a it's a software as a service product. Uh, we have the first customers, and and um, that is that is my biggest worry. Like like, that if if an investor if a VC comes along and sees okay, uh, this main shareholder is not involved 100% of the time. Um, so, yes, that that is that is uh, that first the first question is of course, uh, are you flexible in your position? Uh, to change that for the benefit of the company. So do you yourself see that, that, uh, that it can be a problem for the company to grow? It's, yes, I, I, I see that, that um, you know, I've, I've, I've also um, invested the, the most amount of, of cash money in the business. My partner has invested the most work, but it's yeah. this, this equity split reflects more or less what would how we value the business and how we we value our our individual uh, contributions like like you were mentioning before and still i don't i don't see it, this this situation with my other uh, commitments changing so, yeah so I, exactly okay so so, uh, so that's already a, a very good situation for you if you if you are even thinking about that then it basically means there is no investments happening without conversations about this topic. So that most likely to me, it sounds that you would uh, come to a, a logical outcome, whatever that may be. I mean, it doesn't need to be that you give up too much, but it, it's just being flexible and then understanding that position. So I think that there is no kind of too big of a risk of, of not being able to find an arrangement. The second part uh, of, of my, my perspective is that uh, that you, re from what you say, you actually are more or less have some alignment for what how investors think. Because if you have put most money, then you are looking like a, a bit of an investor in your own company instead of a, a kind of operational founder, which then the investor is more easier to even understand your position in that sense. So I don't I don't see it in in your case. As a problem, it would be a case if you wouldn't kind of see that as a, as a potential problem, and therefore the negotiation would be complex. But I actually think that if if you get in open-mindedly to that uh, position and you just kind of lay out what has happened, then I, I don't see any reason why with the good investors would would see that a problem. They would just make suggestions of, of from that position how it looks to them and what should happen to the company and ownership or potential additional team members going forward. Thank you so much. That, that uh, is very uh, alleviating. Okay. Okay. So um, thanks, thanks for the question. Let's have another one. 
Um, it's trying to go in order here. Uh, Arthur? Yeah, you mentioned several times good investors. Can you comment on that? Of course, this topic is very broad, but can you comment what, what do you mean? What's your experience of good investors? Yeah, so, so uh, like investors should be considered exactly the same way as any other type of person you want to get attached to your company. Ask for references, and the best ones to give references about investors are their past portfolio company entrepreneurs. So those who have actually worked with them and lived through them, it doesn't matter whether they have succeeded or failed. Um, so investors should be able to give references of, of entrepreneurs that they can have you have a conversation about. And of course, you can find most of this information also outside. So a good investor is someone who is fitting for what they are industry specific, what they are after, they are ge geographically uh, aligned with their position, their fund uh, model is fit so that they have enough money to invest, that their fund is not closing you know, next year, that they need to start getting exits, uh, but most importantly that the people have been long time in their position and they have references to give uh, for entrepreneurs that you can call and say, hi, how is this investor? How has it been working with them through you know, tough times, good times? What, the, what do they actually have done and, and how have you resolved issues and things like that? So good investors have references for entrepreneurs and, and that's the best, best, best thing. The next best thing is of course then organizations uh, that are, have worked with them, but that is not the same thing as working with entrepreneurs. Okay. Uh, let's have... Uh, Jesus Ramirez. So we're in a crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, cryptocurrency environment. Okay. And, some and some companies are creating currencies and they're sort of working as a sort of a stock in some cases like in Bitcoin, but not. Yeah. Are there any examples where, where collaborators were rewarded with currency that later transferred and became, it's like a pre-stock before it became a stock option or, 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 or a stock scenario? Well, in, in a traditional uh, sense, those are uh, the stock options are exactly kind of that type of thing that is convertible to to actual equity, and it can be even much later time um, that 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 actually converts. Uh, and usually, then it also has uh, tax uh, tax things that that uh, then most likely at the time when it converts the it. it the, the stock should be at somewhat liquid that the company can buy it back or it can be sold somewhere so that the potential tax tax kind of issues that come from converting an option to actual share uh, can be paid. So that's that's generally in, in kind of the, the current world. Uh, the, the whole uh, initial coin offering eco world is, is uh, very interesting and a new very untested uh, market that already is giving quite interesting outcomes, but basically that is exactly designed to to basically have something similar, a tradable thing like a share is, but not actual shares. But then the connection is like what is the underlying asset that uh, this coin is attached to and uh, and uh, usually it may be something like uh, uh, similar to non-equity crowdfunding that it's a specific product or right to use a product for lifetime or certain time period or 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 uh, IPR or something that is protected with or attached to something that company needs but not necessarily equity because if it attached specifically to shares, then it gets into that gray area that may get in troubles with regulators. But at the same time, the whole uh, 
digital uh, currency is still in a gray area. So it's just overall risky uh, with some unknown, unmarket tested risks, but it is working for someone. So, and like many new things, it will find its shape and form, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's something to, it's, a, it's an option to explore and some are doing that, but it's yet unclear how, what kind of outcomes eventually come from that. But those playing in that area are also very aware of the risks that what they are playing with. So in that sense, it's, uh, it's just very new and untested, but it seems to work already. A follow-up follow to that is, 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 the, is there a scenario where half of the company is reserved for, for the user, the collaborator, the, that space where, where, where the, kind of the micro the micro owner of a company, let's say, in like an Uber scenario where half the half of Uber was owned by the taxis or whatever, is 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 that is that a common scenario or a very uncommon scenario? Um, well, I would say that overall, the whole equity crowdfunding and crowdfunding is towards that direction where you want to get customers or key partners or those more attached, more earlier into the kind of caring for the company itself. So, so of course, that is already proven many times over, but it really depends on the type of business uh, and the type of customers that it would have or partners it would have, whether it resonates for them. Okay. So, so it, it's, there's no kind of uh, one model, but it's it's model that depends on the, the actual business model and the market itself. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, I think, uh, Philip? Philip, do you have a question? Oh, there, there was someone, oh, sorry, I didn't put down my, my hand, sorry. There, okay, some... no worries, no worries. Uh, Michael, do you have a, another question? Yeah, last question. Um, I would like to, uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around the vesting process. Can you just explain in short vesting? So, so, so basically it means that while you have the shares and the ownership in your uh, possession, basically, there they, they are restrictions to, to you actually um, using them or releasing them. So basically it means that if you don't uh, deliver on your obligations, then that vesting means that a company has right to acquire those shares back. And you, having signed the agreement, have uh, agreed to this arrangement up front. So basically the, it means that there are restrictions to your ownership, even though you hold it. It's like the same as you, you, know, you buy something at a down payment. Yeah. You buy it and you own it, you can fully use it, uh, but you actually can't sell it, you can't harm it, you can't, uh, so, and if you don't pay all the, all the uh, payments, then it, it's going to be collected back from you. Okay. And lastly, also in, in terms of ownership, how much of sweat equity goes into actually the ownership percentage? So even if the product hasn't been created, I've been putting investing hours, time, etc. Pre, pre-launch or pre-product has been made. How much of that goes into actually negotiating equity? So basically, uh, I mean, it's really the simplest way to think about in the way of how long have you been doing it and how many hours on average per week you have used progress making this progress. And then comparing to that, someone starts from zero, and you just kind of lay those lines on, 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 lay those over three years, and say, okay, I already started here. The three years would come uh, here. I have done so much, and if you start also from contributing uh, from here, then this is how eventually on the mark of three years it could be two years, five years, but basically it just kind of gives a model of uh, how to how to use logic to, to have a conversation about that. Then it's any party's right and obligation basically to argue whether that logic works 
or whether the value was created or how much of that is value, but very few can argue against time used if they, they are going to be measured on the same amount. So then when put investing on top of launching the product, then also you may want to put something on top of what you're going to perform on. But this becomes a kind of a, a, a discussion and negotiation that you need to have to find that, okay, if I do this and you do that, then I feel it's equal. And I understand you have already done that. So, but at the end of the day, it comes down to agreeing that all of the, the things that you have done uh, and will do, you mutually agree what the value is. And, and also, most importantly, before this, is to have the conversation that you share the same vision and, and uh, kind of the, the longer term outcomes of the company. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. And uh, Jesus, do you have an additional question? Uh, Jesus Ramirez? Okay, I guess not. Okay, so um, I think at this point uh, we have uh, passed the time and also the time that uh, we, we postponed it a little bit uh, uh, getting it started. So uh, I'm starting to be ready to close the session. So uh, any final questions or comments at this point, uh, feel, re feel to, to raise your hand for the final time. And uh, if you have something you want to share uh, before we close or ask from the, the, any of the points afterwards or so forth, uh, feel free to do so now uh, before I close the session. Okay, Philip. Hi, uh, thanks. One one last question: If if a, a later a, a co-founder comes along, so so you know, since I'm not able to spend uh, all my time with this new venture, and it's and it's my partner 100% of the time, and if we if we find um, a co-founder, like usually after after there there has been some seed money, uh, like it is in our case. Like what? What could be the the equity split for for or the percentage that a, that a later a co-founder could get? Um, like yeah. So so uh, um, it's of course uh, the 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 further along the venture goes and the the more it is on, I would say normal path or successful path the more it becomes a, a, a kind of a negotiation. So there's less and less uh, kind of um, uh, kind of points of reference to, to pinpoint exactly what is the value of a, a person contribution for a specific business and what is the, the theoretical value of the company at any given time. So, so the, the, it, it gets more difficult to, to calculate, but the, the way to, to structure it in, in, in any of those is uh, for any position, the, the more opportunities then increase in ways of building a path of, of any ways if, that, if you're going to join us now and if you're going to stick for this long time and you are going to take on this responsibility area where you can most likely grow the value of the company this much. Uh, and going through that kind of conversation instead of just black and white, you're going to join how much equity it's going to be. Uh, the, that turning the conversations toward future and the contribution and the value they can generate is anyway a, a good uh, kind of approach to negotiate to that point what they should get today with what kind of terms. So that is the kind of the, the, the logic and then you can have option plan or even like a you know, you work for one month and we'll give you, you know, 2,000 and that's it and that's it, nothing else. But if we both want to continue, we actually don't pay you 2,000, you get your first option or we put the option plan in place or we put the next phase in, in place. So to structure it um, stages and kind of from 
and reflecting from future value that they're going to create as they join usually leads to, to more aligned uh, negotiation and easier to agree. But what exact number gets harder and harder to say, but um, looking at it from what the value is going to be built on the future, it gets easier. Then if the company is actually in, not in a good path, so that basically it means that if someone doesn't join or if the existing members leave, the company will start to go down or not make progress anymore, then you need to get kind of a significant new equity in place to, to motivate people who will take it forward from there. So then the whole negotiation is very different. So that really depends on the, what situation the company is. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Eleanor? Oh, hi. Sorry. Um, I, it's hard to figure out if the hand's up or down. Um, I have one last question. Do you um, know, if would you have a resource on um, something like a book or something that's good in terms of uh, fund like funding and figuring out uh, percentages and all the kind of intricacies of equity because it's uh, it's a lot to swallow and um, one just like I'll give you a good example the reason why I'm asking is because I had this accelerator two accelerators that wanted me to join them and one of them wanted without any money being given to us wanted three percent equity um, and you know, I don't really. I, at first, I thought, oh, well, that's not much. And luckily, I spoke to a lot of people who said, don't you dare give three percent equity with if they're not investing anything except for like quote unquote mentoring. So, if you had some sort of like resource that would be good that it would help, and I think other people in the um, session were also trying to figure out, you know, equity and how, the role that plays. That would be helpful. So yeah, so definitely um, the when it comes to accelerators, for example, they 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 tend to play with fixed models, and I think it's it's good because then for whomever that specific fixed model works, then it just accelerates the the whole process of negotiation because there is none. But uh, but but uh, but really, it doesn't really matter whether it's accelerator or business angel or business advisor. Or a business contact is is it, it comes down to very basic things that checking their past performance records by those mm -hmm. who have interacted with them in the past uh, mm -hmm. because that three percent may be really really good deal if they mm -hmm. have track record that they can deliver way more value than that three percent is regardless if they put money but mm -hmm. at the same time it's it's a it's a really bad deal if if they are going to take that equity and not do anything and that's just the pattern of how they operate but that's usually mm -hmm. pretty easily Google you know about reputation of different actors mm -hmm. uh, uh, with it doesn't take too much research but usually you can even you know open a question in LinkedIn openly that will considering uh, applying to this accelerator to is there someone who experienced with that you can check uh, with different mm -hmm communities around the area, startup communities in around the area where they operate. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just quite straightforward getting their references and then also if you can say, oh, I'm, I'm happy to take the 3% deal, but I just want to put vesting on top of the promises that you make, how you're going to grow the value of our company. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then you say it's not. I'm not trying to keep you away from the three percent. I just want to put something in place that actually guarantees that the actions that you're going to take are valuable. Mm. So, but but uh, the, the you can get some sense of ranges. What is right equity to right state of development for if you compare accelerators and their deals on average? It's between. Uh, if they offer money, it's usually uh, five to seven percent from thirty to hundred k, let's say, uh, investment. Mm. 
But if someone is doing purely for equity, then clearly they're already showing that they're not trying to get the same amount that with someone who gets money. But of course, if they have an accelerator, they're trying to make it work. They just don't have money yet. But then you may want to consider whether they're suitable for you. So. Yeah. Do you have any book that you would recommend on that it kind of explains equity and um, you know because some several people asked about vesting and things like that. Um, would you have a, a book that you would recommend or an online course or something? Um, I would say that uh, um, I don't have a specific book in mind, but to me, kind of book gets quite deep and heavy on one single topic because there's so many okay. topics. In, in startups uh, per se, but you can find pretty good. Uh, I would say if you look white combinators, kind of these white papers type of blog posts. Uh, um, this uh, the, the founder of Y Combinator. Uh, those articles are quite trustworthy and quite level-headed. Um, so okay. even though Silicon Valley based. Uh, entity is one of the most kind of entrepreneurial, kind of minded and driven, and, and so I, I would say that is a, a good source for for a lot of information. But other than that, equity is hard because it, it gets to kind of the deal. What do we get, and and can you deliver? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, let's see. Uh, Jesus, do you have a final question? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I think it has come time to uh, close the session. So